steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away home, I ain't got long to stay. At first, the tobacco plantations were worked by both slaves and indentured whites. Indentured servitude, which had existed in old England as well, began as a process in which a young man would apprentice himself to a skilled craftsman. In return, the apprentice would provide his labor for a set number of years, for being taught a trade and provided financial support. As tobacco plantations required more and more labor, indentured servitude became a means of strictly providing a labor force rather than the old apprenticeships. In those years, African and European indentured servants might work side by side. Africans could purchase their freedom through work, just as Europeans. Like slaves, servants could be sold, transferring the years remaining on their term of service to the new owner. This practice made it easier for Virginia's planters to soon accept the buying and selling of African slaves. Nonetheless, Africans working as indentured servants enjoyed considerably more freedoms than the African slaves who would soon replace them. But this situation would not last. An early sign of the changes to come occurred in 1641 a Virginia court sentenced three indentured servants who had run away from their masters. Two of the men were white, and they were each sentenced to an extra year of service. The one black man was sentenced to a lifetime of servitude. This was the first known case of enslavement in Virginia. In one of the first known cases of slavery in North America, the slave owner was actually a black colonist in Virginia. Anthony Johnson had once been an indentured servant who had completed his term of service and earned enough to buy out his wife's contract. He would eventually go on to import African slaves, earning 250 acres of land for his work. Over the years, the preference for indentured European servants shifted to a preference for African slaves. A number of factors led to this change. England's civil war in the 1640s had increased the number of people willing to indenture themselves in the New World, and the end of that war in 1651 meant a sharp drop in volunteers. Meanwhile, tobacco planters in Virginia were expanding their land and needed cheap labor. Landholders also found slaves to be cheaper in the long run than indentured servants, who eventually expected to be freed, paid, and given land. English indentured servants also demanded to be treated like Englishmen, while African slaves could be held under harsher conditions. To increase the number of slaves brought to the colony, in 1659, Virginia lowered import duties for merchants bringing African slaves to the colony. A year later, Britain greatly expanded its participation in the slave trade. While all this was going on, Virginia was passing laws codifying slavery. First, a 1661 law established that, as had been done in the earlier case, Africans who ran away from indentured servitude would be sentenced to serve their masters for life. Other laws made the condition of slavery hereditary and allowed the use of force against slaves. In 1656, Elizabeth Key Grinstead became the first woman of African ancestry to sue for her freedom and win. Her case was based on the fact that her father was an Englishman and she had been baptized a Christian. 
the legislature responded to the court's decision. Be it enacted and declared by this present General Assembly that all children born in this country shall be held bond or free only according to the conditions of the mother. It is enacted and declared by this Grand Assembly that the conferring of baptism doth not alter the conditions of the person as to the bondage of freedom. In other words, if a child's mother was a slave, the child would also be a slave, regardless of the father's status, and baptism into Christianity would no longer be a path to freedom. Other legislation followed. It is declared and enacted by this assembly that moderate corporal punishment inflicted by master or magistrate upon a runaway servant shall not deprive the master of the satisfaction allowed by law. Be it enacted and declared by this grand assembly, if any slave resists his master, and by the extremity of the correction should chance to die, that his death shall not be accounted a felony, since it cannot be presumed that premeditated malice should induce any man to destroy his own estate. It is enacted that all servants which shall be imported into this country, whether Negroes, Moors, Mulattoes, or Indians, whose parentage and native countries are not Christian, are hereby deemed to be slaves. It is hereby enacted that all Negro, Mulatto, and Indian slaves shall be adjudged to be real estate, and shall descend unto the heirs according to the manner and custom of land inheritance. Other colonies and states would copy these codes, in some cases choosing even harsher language. On top of these demographic, economic, and legislative changes, there was a more immediate and visceral incentive to shift from indentured to slave labor in Virginia, Bacon's Rebellion. In 1676, a young planter named Nathaniel Bacon led an uprising against Virginia's governor. He and his followers were angered at the governor's refusal to expel or exterminate the local Native Americans. Many indentured servants, both white and black, took part in the rebellion, which first slaughtered a group of friendly natives and then burned Jamestown to the ground. After Bacon died of dysentery during the campaign, many of his followers returned to their homes. The rebel forces were defeated. But the planters and the colonial government had been given a tangible reason to shift from a free labor force that could legally bear arms and gather in large groups, to enslaved workers who were forbidden arms under the law and whose entire lives were under the control of their masters. The impact of all these changes was dramatic. In 1648, within Virginia, would reside only 300 slaves. By 1670, there were 2,000 slaves in Virginia, and that rose again to 8,000 by 1700. In just over 50 years, the number of African slaves in Virginia increased by 7,700 and went from being 2% of the colony's population to almost 14%. In another 50 years, there would be 120,000 slaves in Virginia. Such was the power of tobacco. In the early years, tobacco was grown on numerous smaller farms. This wasn't profitable, so Planters aggressively expanded their fields into land previously controlled by the Pamunkey Indians. At the same time the plantations were growing larger, the demand for tobacco was rising just as fast. The one piece missing in the supply-demand chain was a cheap force of labor. Initially, these needs were met by indentured servants, 
then by an odd combination of indentured and enslaved workers. But as we've seen, eventually slave labor replaced indentured work almost completely. Working the tobacco fields required a great deal of care, as the tobacco leaf is quite vulnerable to the weather. The fields were typically prepared in January, with planting beginning in March. Tobacco seedlings were then transferred to the fields, where they were given the utmost care. The plants were finally cut and dried in August or September. Once they had been dried, the tobacco leaves were bundled into barrels for shipping. Slaves then delivered the barrels to inspection houses and finally loaded them on ships bound to England. What was life like as a slave on a tobacco plantation? Here are the words of Silas Jackson, a slave who worked tobacco in the 19th century. We were awakened by blowing up a horn before sunrise by the overseer. Started work at sunrise and work all day to sundown. With not time to go to the cabin for dinner, <laughs> you carried your dinner with you. The slaves were driven at top speed and whipped at the snap of a finger by the overseer. We had four overseers on the farm, all hired white men. I've seen men beaten until they dropped in their tracks or knocked over by clubs. Women stripped down to their waist and cowhided. Another former slave, Henry Clay Bruce, wrote of his experiences as a slave on a tobacco plantation in the mid-19th century. My good time ended when I was put to the plow in the spring of 1848. The land was hilly and rocky. I, being of light weight, could not hold the plow steadily in the ground, however hard I tried. My master was my trainer and slapped my jaw several times for that which I could not prevent. I knew then, as well as I know now, that this was unjust punishment. But after the breaking season and the planting of the crop of corn and tobacco was over, I was given a lighter single horse plow and enjoyed the change and the work. Compared with some of his neighbors, our master was not a hard man on his slaves because we enjoyed many privileges that other slaves did not have. Some slave owners did not feed well, causing their slaves to steal chickens, hogs, and sheep. But our master gave us all we could eat, together with such vegetables as were raised on the farm. My mother was the cook for the families, white and black, and of course, I fared well as to food. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.